Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Movie in a Han. It's a brand new year, but it's the same old us. I'm RJ. I'm Paige. And today, we're going back in time to New Year's 2022. <laughs> oh, yes. Jesus Christ. It's been a year. So, here's the quick background. In 2022, Paige got COVID. <laughs> right in the start of 2022. <laughs> right at the start. And the first movie we recorded was a Candyman double feature. Um, I will let you know that this is one of the this is one of those times where it was not Paige doing anything wrong on this one. It was all me. Shocker. It's always me. So shocker. I fucked up my audio got fucked. And for the last year, we have not had this episode. Paige was a lot more sad than I was because she was like, it's such a good episode. It's so good. Why like I don't care about the second bit. The second bit sucked, but the first bit was good. And I'll acknowledge it was a it's a genuinely a really good episode. Towards the end of last year, I found the audio in the sense of I was able to recover it for the first movie. And we're going to release it right now as a warning. This episode was made exactly one episode. This was the last episode of old audio before we did an audio revamp, which means the audio is going to suck. So please stick around. I promise you it's actually a pretty decent episode and um, I hope you guys enjoy and please join us uh, for our next, next time. Yeah. So enjoy our recovery. Yes. And we'll see you at Hellraiser. All right. Enjoy. All right, everybody. We're going to be talking first about Candyman 1992. I do want to mention if you decide to watch the movie after we discuss it, uh, I want to let you know about an epilepsy warning. Um, there are a lot of flashing scenes and lights throughout the entire movie. Um, it was a little rough for me. Uh, and if you have any of those type of issues, please go in there knowing. Okay. so Especially the ending. Yeah. So The ending's really bad. Just be careful, and we'll go ahead and start talking about it now. All right. Already, as I start this Wikipedia breakdown, they re- they skip the beginning of the movie. Great. A good part um, of the movie. The part... <laughs> uh, no, they basically skip the intro where uh, Tony Todd gives like that giant monologue. Oh, I love it. With the zoom in on the bees, yes. which is not what I want to see when the movie starts. It's great. And how like, the bees are over Chicago, and they kind of like, you know... It, Zooms into, I think it goes right into Helen's face. Oh, I don't remember that part, but... Like, it fades into Helen's face oh, from the sky. Oh, yes, 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 because obviously she's his main victim. Yes. Um, but um, Tony Todd could sing me a lullaby, and I'd be the happiest person ever. Oh, this is Horror Daddy. It, oh, God. <laughs> yes. He, he is Horror Daddy. <laughs> um, but I, fun fact. Oh, I just want to say that Bee Swarm reminds me of, like, the biblical locust swarm. Um which was very interesting to me. That wouldn't shock me because this is based off of a story by Clive Barker. Oh, yes, true. But go ahead, continue. Um, unfortunate thing is this is this short story, I believe, is in one of the books of blood. Mm. So in preparation for this episode, you know I own some books of blood. It is one of the only books I don't own that this is the short story of. Really? Like, it's included in one I don't own, and I was so annoyed, because I was like, man, I actually could have had comparisons for once in my life. But, I'll read the first sentence. (laughs) We gotta piece this one together. (laughs) While researching urban legends, University of Illinois Chicago uh, graduate student Helen Lyle learns of the Candyman, a spirit who kills anyone who says his name five times in front of a mirror. Now, that's a very broad statement of what actually happens. You get an actual interaction with him. You get like a urban legend mm-hmm. and it's of a girl and her biker boyfriend. Billy. His name's Billy. And his he, name's Billy. Yeah. He's he's yeah. uh played by Ted Raimi, uh, which is the brother to Sam Raimi, the director, and he's also Joxer and Xena, which was fun for me <laughs> that's uh, i was very that's such a short scene for that guy. i know oh, this is probably before he got big uh 1992 ish um but it was a nice little surprise for a fan of me <laughs> it could also be a shout uh, out to evil dead you know 
that whole yeah. family and their legacy with horror. Um, I will say this scene starts out horny. It's like, <laughs> say his name as I'm horny. Which, the one thing I like about this movie is I think um, her friend brings it up later. How it's like, all the white people think that nothing is going to affect them. As they usually do in any situation. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's just all the stupid shit that has hap- that happens in this movie. has. It starts with, white person thinks they can get away with it. Turns out they can. Guess what? That's the entire movie. Um, and it begins with this one where babysitter, is, like has her boyfriend say it four times. He leaves because he's like he nopes. As a smart person, yeah. like here's the thing: even if it's not real, as a precaution, <laughs> don't do Just it. Just don't do it. Why? Why? Just why like risk if it? someone goes, if someone tells me, okay, there's that place and it's really haunted, and like bad stuff happens there. I don't care if I don't believe in it. Out of precaution of just in case, because I can't prove it's real or false, I'm not going to go there. Exactly. Like, why take that I'm risk? Do shit. No, thank you. She finishes it, and she gets uh, gutted, I think? Yeah, like right up, you know, from, from bottom to top. Yep. Um, and basically, we meet her. We meet her friend. Mm-hmm. Um. And she base it's they're doing a paper on um urban legends. urban legends yep Helen and you know she thinks it's fake so later on do yeah later on um she is in like her like a classroom and the cleaning crew brings up that oh yeah something happened there like it's legit with candy man yeah it's um <laughs> right off the bat what are we maybe 10 minutes into the movie it's just a white educated woman getting information from an african-american sanitary worker uh who lives on the bad side of chicago south side um so you are, you automatically know where this movie is going where it's you know the root of the whole thing is it's not just a horror movie oh and by now, we also know that uh, Helen's husband totally cheating on her. Oh yeah, and also he <laughs> did totally s- he did her. something uh, that like oh he messed with her control group or whatever that she was doing her project with, and he completely ruined her research because he's an asshole. So basically, school curriculum said he had to teach this, and she asked him not to teach it because she was writing her paper and it would harm the paper exactly he ends up teaching it and she gets upset yeah, about that obviously I which would be i too. get it from both sides like you're a teacher if it's part of the curriculum mm-hmm. you get paid to do it you kind of yeah but he could have pushed it back you know what i mean i think he i didn't he say he tried to or he did it already i don't know i hated him I right off the bat so oh he's not I, yeah no he's not like <laughs> um she's inspired to take on the project after learning about a recent murder and she soon learns of two dozen more attributed to the candy man two dozen again not a surprise that the cops aren't investigating a flurry of killings in the projects in chicago um skeptical helen and her friend bernadette i feel so bad for bernadette i love bernadette i do too she did not deserve what happens in this movie she was done dirty uh repeat the candy man's name in uh to helen's bathroom mirror but nothing happens which is also in this scene we get the which i would be living in pure fear every night of my life that the bathroom mirrors burst out on each side of the apartments yes she she tells us about that Mm -hmm. yeah um because i think her house her place used to be part of Caprini of Caprini Greens or was like part of like that part of town and then it got re revamped worked into like a higher lug um, quote unquote luxury quote unquote luxury yeah <clears throat> so she per- she pops out her mirror and bursts the apartment next door's mirror and she's like well if 
the story is true about the woman who got killed because she was saying someone was trying to break in through the wall. The person probably came in through the mirror, which means whatever the story is, it's on the other side of that mirror in that apartment at Cabrini Greens. And I can understand her logic from that. And her whole point is trying to disprove the urban legends for her research paper. So yes. I can I can get where she's going with it. Um uh, Helen Bernadette worked together on a thesis about how Cabrini Green residents use the Candyman legend to cope with hardship, which to an extent is true. Right. Um, but the thing is, they believe they use it as a coping mechanism and it's fake. The reality is they know it's real. They're terrified of it. So it is like a weird coping mechanism in that way. But they know it's not a fake thing. Mm -hmm. um, we then get them driving to Cabrini Greens. And Bernadette's like, why the fuck are we doing this? Yeah. I, again, I want to say I absolutely love their partnership. Uh, one, it's a great friendship. But also they have mad respect for both of each other. Like for each other. Yes. And oh, it makes what happens to Bernadette a little bit even more upsetting. Yeah, um, we'll get to that one yeah. a little bit later. But now, like, they're driving over. Mm -hmm. Also, can I just backtrack for a little bit? Sure. I didn't go over something, and I'm disappointed in myself. Okay. The opening of kind of like the drone shot of the city moving, like in the opening credits. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Oh, please. The totally terrifying. The I just want to say like just a flat base the cinematography and the lighting oh fantastic for this entire movie fantastic amazing just i love it when we before we get to the end of it i'm just gonna say this cinematography great acting really good lighting great music phenomenal editing as well uh, the was piano very string well it's a weird thing because this movie is, I think, only seven minutes longer than the, uh, the 2021 version, and I feel like it handled it so much better for a movie that's not that much longer. We'll talk about it when we finish um, talking about both, but yes, yes, just as a baseline. Yeah. Oh, it's, I'm going to do a lot of comparisons, okay. I think. Um, but they're driving to Capiti Greens. Bernadette's like, we should go back. You know, sus warning. <laughs> We're going to Caprini Greens. And uh, Helen's like, oh, well, how – fine, we'll go back, we'll fail, our, pa our paper will flop, you know. I think she uses the excuse of, like, no one else would do this, so we should. Yeah, like, uh, it's also kind of like a women's empowerment type of moment because yes. she's talking about how the her the previous people who did some sort of research on this were these two guys, and she's like – you know, we got to be better than them. We got to step it up. But also, she they both admitted they wouldn't do this. Exactly. Like, this yeah. is something that's out of their wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, they get to Caprini Greens, and, like, the next sentence, unfortunately, is she and Bernadette visit the scene of a murder where Helen discovers a room where offerings have been left for the Candyman. This skips a lot of shit that yes. happens. Um, they... They get there, yep. and they automatically think they're cops. A hundred percent. They look like cops. <laughs> I was just like, man, like, she just has a trench coat on. <laughs> but they look in a professional manner, yeah. you know, that only cops would come around in this area. They're immediately harassed. Um, oh, uh, they, they get catcalled. It was disgusting. Right, right. I felt extremely uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, the entire way they were there, going there. Um, and then they get to the apartment where the murder happens. Yeah. Um. So while they're getting up, I remember like Bernadette is not, she wants to get the hell out of there. And Helen's like, they think we're cops. We're fine. Mm -hmm. Which I was like, I don't know if that would be my logic <laughs> is they think we're cops. Everything is fine. Again, white woman. Mm. <laughs> Literally, this is all, this is like all, everything mm -hmm. that happens to her, she instigates. Yeah. yeah. Like through a series of domino effects. Mm -hmm. Um, she gets to we they get you get a quick jump scare of the Wattweiler at um in the uh Anne Marie McCoy's apartment that like pops out 
when she's taking a picture of the graffiti on the wall. Yeah. Um, they eventually get into the place. It's just wide open of where um, the woman was murdered and burned dead. Rightfully so, I was like, this place stinks. And I'm like, yeah, Duh. so I got killed in there. It's going to fucking reek. Um, oh, God, I, I feel this is something I don't like. You are already in a very dire situation. You got your photos. Get out of there. Yeah, just, just, you're done. Helen's like, let me go through the mirror <laughs> to the other apartment. To, to validate my, yeah. you know, thought process. And Bernadette, rightfully so, is like, they could be hiding drugs on the other side of this wall. Like, you could be literally just walking into a literal, like, drug area. Mm-hmm. She's like, hello <laughs> is anybody there click click see it's safe <laughs> it's like oh god uh this scene does include one of my favorite shots though it's of her walking through the wall and it's through the candy man's mouth yes also it's fucking creepy shot it's fantastic when she's walking through the lighting is perfect it gives off a very uh noir-esque type Mm -hmm. of experience uh, because there's a lot of shots where it's dark and we're getting just lighting on her eyes to really accentuate her fear of going through this area especially later on when like she's in trances like when she gets entranced by Candyman, he like she gets kind of just over the eyes and to me that kind of goes back to the old dracula movie um where you know you get into a trance and the lighting and is just on the eyes to accentuate that so i thought that was a nice little callback all right i'm gonna let us continue afterwards they meet the victim's neighbor Anne marie mccoy a single mother raising her infant son anthony that's actually that's actually all that really happens it's kind of a this is one of the few times where i feel like the movie kind of expo dumps yeah. Um, plus, this is a firsthand experience of a woman who knew the woman yeah. who was murdered. Um, it also gives an insight onto her view of these women who are coming into her neighborhood, asking questions about things she doesn't want to answer. You know. Yeah. Um, I think because I think this was actually actually a relatively short scene for yeah, like introduction. Um. Helen and her husband, Trevor. Fuck you, Trevor. His name was Trevor? (laughs) His name's Trevor. (laughs) Oh, God. Okay. Have dinner with Professor Philip Purcell, an expert on the Candyman legend, who says that the Candyman was born in the late 1800s as the son of a slave and grew up to become a well-known artist. That's a good summary. Which, it's a good summary, but basically I think the whole, like, wraparound of this one is they didn't, how about this? They viewed him as just like they viewed um, Candyman as a for his talent, not as a person. Yeah, it was just like, oh, this person has the talent to paint me. Mm-hmm. And if I remember correctly, yes, this is actually it. After he fell in love with. With an impregnated, uh, impregnated white woman, he fell. His father sent a lynch mob after him. Mm-hmm. They cut off his right hand and smeared him with honeycomb stolen from an apiary, attracting bees that stung him to death. Um, his corpse was burned in a pyre, and his ashes were scattered across the land on which Caprini Green was eventually built. This is just to give more of an expo dump on the the origin legend of Candyman, yeah. and also. The way it was edited was we're coming from a struggling working class African-American woman right into a upper middle class white table, white, you know, cloth table, educated dinner party. And you can kind of see how Helen isn't really connecting with this world anymore. Um, You know what I mean? I think that was just to give Mm -hmm. us a link between those two. So that was a really nice way to connect it. I also think this expo dump existed for the reason of why he gets, like, super thirsty for her right. towards the end of the movie. Um, which, basically, I, I'm pretty sure it's just, it's attached to he looks like her. I'm uh, sorry, she looks like the woman he impregnated. Unless she's part of the actual bloodline, which would be even more bloodline. interesting. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I this is the one time where I view expo dumps as completely fine because there's no way you are going to give this to me if it's not in an expo dump. Exactly. And also, it's more Tony Todd. Of course. and As much as I love him, he's not in this movie enough. Uh, please. It, it, you get most of him to like the second half to the end of the movie. And I'm just like, where's yep. my man? I want to see him. <laughs> <laughs> I want more. Um, eventually. Uh, so basically, the next line is, when Helen returns to Caprini Green, a man calling himself the Candyman attacks her. This cuts a lot of crap. Yeah. Um, she goes back to the place. Yep. She meets a kid. She goes to Anne Marie's place, mm-hmm. if I remember correctly. Anne Marie isn't there. Uh, yeah, but she, she meets a boy. Yeah. For the love of me, I can't I remember can't remember his name. his name. Oh, Jake. His name's Jake. Oh, Jake. Okay. okay. She meets Jake, and I remember correctly, he's he's saying that Kenny Man is real. Yeah. And she's like, she was like, and I think he brings up the bathroom from like a story. Yeah, uh, someone got murdered by the Candyman, yeah. quote unquote, uh, quote unquote, in the bathroom in the apartment complex area. Also, probably the most disturbing part of the movie was this one. A hundred percent. Not what happens to her. What happens to the kid yeah. in the bathroom? Uh, that was disturbing. Absolutely gruesome. Uh, it, um, it I will was not very be going into that on this episode. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, <clears throat> it's just it's very disturbing. Mm-hmm. Um, but eventually she goes into the bathroom. She, I'm guessing it smells like shit. Well, there's literal shit, shit written on the, walls. on the walls. Yeah. So it's um, not going to smell open, great. Uh, she kicks open two stalls. Then the third stall where we know it happened, um, is bees. Bees inside the toilet. Yeah. Which, you know that even though he doesn't reveal himself, he is there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she gets attacked by a drug dealer. Who calls himself the Candyman. Right. He's using the legend of Candyman to boost yeah. her up his repertoire. Yeah. Exactly. Um, eventually, uh, he leaves and the boy goes, uh, Jake goes into the bathroom, checks on her. I guess he calls the cops. Uh, yeah, he must have. Uh, basically, they beat the shit out of her. Um, yeah. And poor little. I mean, there was a puddle of blood underneath her head. It was bad. It right. was really bad. Yeah. Um, her eye was blown up. Yeah, the makeup for that was really good. Uh, was really but good. poor little Jake has to see all that shit. You know what I mean? I felt really oh, bad. Yeah. Um, she uh, We just cut straight to um, a suspect line. Uh, yes. Yes. Yep. Uh, she identifies her attacker. It turns out to be the head of a gang called the Overlords. The police assume he's responsible for the murders. Now, there is a scene in this that she i think she says it and she says a bunch of people get murdered but one white woman gets attacked and all of a sudden they like they salt it yeah she says it because she's aware of the privilege that she has yeah um which she is right on this one it's like without question she got attacked and you caught this person not like like that yeah and it's in comparison to like the two dozen murders that have happened in that area now, that have not been talked about at all if i remember correctly <clears throat> the cops used the excuse well no one's lived so we couldn't like pinpoint it on him but since you lived and you were able to point him out we actually got yeah him. they're using that bullshit it's we know the real truth for sure oh yeah um jake's also at the police department he's worried about um you know, this getting back to the neighborhood that he's a snitch, mm-hmm. um, which yep. completely understandable. Uh, Helen's like, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, mm, well, not really. <laughs> um, if I remember, oh, well, because the, the next thing I have is the real candy man appears to Helen in a parking garage. It hypnotizes her. We skip like probably seven minutes. Of yeah. Um, I think we skipped that whole scene with, Helen making a beautiful dinner for her husband. Yep. This is the literally the next scene. Yeah. Um I hate him. <laughs> I hate him so much. He's a... And here's the thing, I don't even feel bad for him when he like cries at the end no. because it's like No. You you fucked up. Um yeah, she's still really injured uh, and she makes this beautiful dinner for him and she's trying to reconnect with him and you know, try to be really nice and he's completely blows her off. And then we cut back to 
uh, the Chicago uh, University, mm-hmm. where she meets uh, Bernadette. And Bernadette's like, I got the pictures. Yep. Like, we were able to save the camera. Um, so she goes to her car. I guess Bernadette is on a level below her. Mm-hmm. So she's looking through the files. Bernadette leaves. And we get what is the single most... How do I put this? You know a movie's really good when the viewer is just as entranced as the person who's being entranced in the film. Yes. Yes. The way they introduce him is... Because usually when you introduce someone in a horror movie, it's like, oh, and they killed the person. This guy just... It's a shot. You see mostly his silhouette at first. And he and Tony Todd is in a great pose for, like, a silhouette. And he's just towering he's a very big yes. person and then like you said with the coat it just accentuates that he just has that presence and then like the time of day they shot it the sun was hitting him right in the back yes. so it was like you couldn't even see his face it was pure silhouette mm-hmm. and and he's not talking to her like physically <laughs> he's like mentally talking like to telepathically her, means, yeah so his voice is just i can't describe it it's like it's an it's powerful echo. It's is the best way I could put it. It's overwhelming your senses in the best way. Like we yeah. are Helen in this moment, the way the sound editing is. It's just he is in your head and you can feel that. And I watched this with headphones on. Ooh, like, oh. That's nice. Um The bass. Like the bass they allowed his voice to keep. Yeah. And like I think they added a little bit more bass into it. It just It gets like the bass gets sent through your whole body. Yeah. Um, so it just entrances you as much as she is entranced. And we've been talking about the Candyman, you know, mythos for the entire first half of this movie. And this is the first time we're meeting him. And it's the 45 minute mark on this movie. Oh, this is I this is I would say the end of the second like close to the end of the second act or like the end of the second. I, act. I close to the end of the second act. I think the ending would be after what happens see because i thought this would be the end and then what happens next would be begin the third act okay either way whatever happens what what happens next is either the end or beginning of the third act of this correct um he explains that she discredited his legend and he must shed innocent blood to uh perpetrate it best line of this movie is be my victim Mm mm-hmm because he says it in such a – it's haunting, but it's also romantic. Absolutely. It's like, be mine. Come on. Like, he's handpicking her. Yes. Because he's like – and you can – like best way I can put him is Tony Todd in this movie is haunting, foreboding, and romantic in everything he does. I think that's the perfect description. Um – Oh my god, I just I can't. I don't I don't have words for it. Also, this movie is I think most it gets hornier towards the end, <laughs> but there are times where this movie is like really horny. Oh yeah, and I'm like, like no oh reason. Tony, you devil um, you. But this is the scene where we get that really nice shot of like the light solely on her eyes or like kind of like the eye area of yeah. her face. And she is responding to him, but is in like three to five word sentences and they are not flowing out. It's like she has to work to get these sentences out. Again, I think this is a nice comparison to Dracula is that you're being entranced by the quote unquote monster. And what he's basically saying to her is you're discrediting my urban legend. What happens to urban legends when they're not believed in anymore? They die. And I need mm-hmm. you to rectify that. And that's what we're going to do. And then. So boom. be my victim. Yep. <laughs> also, the scene where the, the shot where because before in the movie, she made the joke about the hook for a hand. Yeah. With the original Candyman. He's like, oh, that's it. And, you know, he reveals the his hook. Mm-hmm. And it's so much. It's like when you made the joke before and now you see the actual thing. It's scary. It's terrifying. Um, oh God, the next scene's so disgusting. This is probably the grossest scene in the movie. Helen blacks out and awakens in Amory's apartment 
covered in blood to find Anne Marie's pet Rottweiler decapitated and her son Anthony stolen. Distraught, Anne Marie attacks Helen, whom the police arrest while she defends herself. That's a good description. So basically, he goes, Be my victim, and we. Can I just say something about this movie? Mm-hmm. Um, it's e- This gets even more highlighted when she's in the mental facility in a little bit. Time moves for us the same exact way it moves for Helen. Yes. Um, like, we don't see what goes on. Everything we know is everything she knows. I thought that was an amazing way to go about this third half of the, or third act of the movie. Yes. Um, because my literal note after that cut is, what the fuck just happened? And that's all yes. that's going through Helen's mind, I'm sure. And she wakes up in a bathroom, bloodied up. Thinking it's her blood. Doesn't know what's going on. And it's not her blood. And then she sees the the dog that's decapitated right next to her. And she's like, I will say, what the fuck? <laughs> I haven't seen this movie since I was like, probably since like 2010, mm-hmm. I'd say. Like, it's it's been a good long while since I've seen this movie. And wa- seeing her open the door and just seeing a dog's head decapitated. So I was like, oh, shit hit the fan. Like, uh, yeah, that's a nice way to put it. But I also like not I like I didn't see it hit the fan. It's like shit hit the fan like an hour ago. <laughs> and now I'm just seeing the repercussions of when it. hit. The yeah. Fan. yeah. Um, but yeah, she hears Amory screaming. She's in like the she's in her room where the, in the, room cr- where, like, the Anthony's crate is. Crate is. Um, absolutely crate is. beautiful acting by. Yeah the lady who does Amory. Um, she's absolutely distraught. Doesn't know what's going on. This, this lady just came out of her bathroom with a knife. Um, not smart girl. Uh, no, uh, don't, don't, don't leave. I get why she left it with a knife. Cause it's like, what if there's someone out there? But also if someone out there is like, you know, innocent, you're going to look very guilty. with. I knife. get both sides. Uh, but the, this whole scene is absolutely pure chaos. I think that's just, just and, the way to describe it. Amor, and Emery attacks her. Obviously. Please come in. Yep. Now, the one thing I was like a little surprised was that they really didn't do much with Emery because Emery was like straight up trying to kill her. And like, they were just like, please back off. Yeah, well, back she's away. absolutely was- inconsolable at this point. Oh, I know, but also I know cops in real life, and that's not <laughs> how they would react. They'd be like, "Oh no, sedate the boat." Of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we cut to the because the next scene is after Trevor bails her out of jail. Helen finds the Candyman in a photographic slide taken at Cabrini Green. We skip the part where she gets to the police station, um, police office, mm-hmm. and she's like asked to strip. Also, the cop that she was buddy-buddy with during her um, yep. lineup is now, like, not her friend whatsoever. We Again, and then we go straight into the strip search, which is humiliating. You know, I mean, we're, we're feeling what Helen's feeling. True, but also this is where, remember I was like, white people would be doing white people shit? <laughs> yeah. This is the peak version of white people are doing white people shit. Elaborate. Because I get the whole, can I take a shower? I get it. You have somebody's blood on yeah. you. That That's cool. Like I'm like, yeah, girl, I get you. Like You're probably scarred by how much blood is all over you right now. But when she gets to the um, interrogation room, she literally says, like, where's Officer Blank? Like, like he'll understand me when I talk to him. I get you. Yeah, no, like, 100%. I'm a victim here. And it's just like, mm, lady, it doesn't look that technically, way. Technically, you, like, we know she is. But they don't. Like, us, we know. I will say, though, the way the cop acts, I was just like, it's, because it, there's that thing of the white person does the white person shit. But then also it's, the man does misogynistic shit. Right. Um, which that officer does towards her. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, Trevor, she's in a, she's, she calls Trevor is not home. Mm-hmm. Um, and Trevor eventually comes in the morning and bails her out. Yeah. She goes home and she goes home. 
And this is what happens. He goes, I'm going to go out real quick while she's in a, in a bath. And she finds, it's a really good scene too. Cause she like, she puts the slides on a projector and she zooms in and all you see is the Candyman's like silhouette. Yeah. And not, not just the, um, cause I feel like some movies would just show the face and be like, Oh look, he was there all along. Now it's like, Oh no. If you're not paying attention, you couldn't even see it now. Yeah, I was I was looking for it, and I'm like, he's there somewhere. And then it shows just a little bit, and I was like, oh, it's it's a much better way than like you said, putting it yeah. straight in your face. But that goes back to what you were saying before about the lighting in that area. Yep, that lighting really accented how cool this reveal was. Mm-hmm. Um, he appears inside Helen's apartment and cuts her neck. Does he cut her neck? I thought I feel like he kind of like paralyzes her in a way. Who, Helen? Yeah, because he puts the hook behind her neck. Uh, maybe it's just instilling absolute fear. <laughs> yeah, because I know it goes in because she starts to bleed. Oh. So I know he pops it into her mm. neck. I'm causing her to bleed and pass out. Bernadette arrives at Helen's apartment, and when Helen comes to, she sees that the Candyman has murdered ben- Bernadette. So. Before she gets incapacitated by Candyman, um, she grabs a knife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, girl. Uh, Bernadette comes in. She gets the groin to gullet special. It was really and sad. That was the one death I was like, fuck. I was really upset about it. I really was. <laughs> I thought she was probably going to make it out and she was just going to be gone after the first yeah, act. But like, it was just kind of no. like. Um, framed for the crime, Helen is sedated and taken to a psychiatric hospital. This is where my, this is where I, where I go, like, we know as much as Helen, as I said before, this is where it is highlighted to the highest extent. Right. First, we get the really cool scene of her strapped in the bed and Candyman kind of like floats over her. Oh God, that scene it was uncomfortable um, Mm -hmm. just because she's in such a vulnerable state. Um, And then no one's going to believe her. They think she's just having an episode, uh, which they go into because they have footage of, you know, her just freaking out by herself. Now, the next uh, thing is uh, a month later, psychiatrist Dr. Burke interviews Ellen to prepare her for her upcoming trial. A trial. This is where uh, my the thing of we know as much as Helen knows, mm-hmm. this is where it's completely highlighted. Because to us, just like Helen, this feels like a day has passed. Yep. So when we learn she's been in there for a month, I'm about, I'm like, I'm as taken aback as she is. 100%. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is what's really great about not knowing more than your main character um just to do a comparison with i guess Candyman 2001 we know more than the main character and that kind of takes away from the the entire experience i like being in the dark going through this with her um it's definitely scarier in that sense for me yes um she attempts to prove her innocence by summoning the Candyman, who appears and murders Dr. Burke, allowing her to escape despite being framed for Burke's murder. Tony Todd just yeets backwards <laughs> through the window. <laughs> Did you see the wire he was on? Obviously. Okay, okay. I, I wanted to make sure that wasn't just No, me. no. Of course, th- this man's going to be on a wire. But still, that was <laughs> very jarring. I was like, Tony, no. <laughs> also, this is the one time where I go, you know what? Helen, you a little fucked up. <laughs> you knew what would happen the minute you said this. Well, because at this point, she's like, no one's going to believe me. I can't get out of here. I'm in this situation. I know where the baby is. Exactly. I need to act. Oh. Yeah. Also, this entire time, she's been getting visions of where Anthony is. Right. Right. And we know where he is because we've been yes. there with her. And no one else has been. Yeah. Um... She, like, does, like, her, you know, her Mission Impossible slash Neo from the Matrix <laughs> scaling. She, like, bangs a window and the, like, the nurse is, like, opens it up yeah. and she just jumps in and just, like, beats her. Oh, it was like, great. Damn. I was like, damn, Helen. 
if you don't want to prove to people that you ain't crazy, this is not the way to do it. You just she doesn't care at this point. She's like, I need to save this child. It's gonna be too late at this point. Uh, she steals nurse's outfit. Um, exits through like I guess the the service elevator. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She returns to her apartment to find Trevor now living with a student from the beginning of the movie. Right, because it's been over a month and this bastard has moved on with his, you know, side piece. She walks in. The apartment's pink now. Ugh. Ugh. Also, um, you remember how I was like, the acting in this movie is great. <laughs> um, this is the one point it ain't. Uh, this is where it's very melodramatic. I think she's like painting and she turns around and she's like, it, like soap opera acting of terrified. It's just like, okay. I don't know if it's the actress oh, that's the okay. issue or if she was told to be an absolute dunce, which is probably the case. Um, but Helen's acting. <laughs> oh, that shit was good. I was just like, girl, uh, you weren't crazy like 30 minutes ago, but he's making you yeah, crazy. Yeah. Um, she confronts him and basically like, call, 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 call the hospital. Yeah, do it. And no one's coming I near fucking her. fucking dare you. And she's like, <laughs> uh, she's like, okay, I got this. <clears throat> and, uh, then flees to Caprini Green to rescue Anthony. Now, I don't like this part only because, like, this part of the, um, description. Because we skip what was probably my, one of my favorite scenes. Throughout this entire movie... The city feels as much of a character as Helen, as Canvany Man, as Trevor, as Bernadette, as Anthony, you know, as everybody, as Anne Marie, like as everybody. Uh -oh. Um, this city feels just as important as them. And this is the scene where she's like on the bridge and she's like Candy Man's talking to like I guess like representate represented through the water. Yeah. And when he talks, the camera like shakes. And I was just like, okay. I understand the stakes now. I understand everything. I am ready for whatever she's going to have to do. And so is she. I'm getting absolute yes. goosebumps just because I'm thinking of it. Um, I think that's a great description of how important Caprini, Caprini Green slash all of Chicago is in this movie. Like you said, it's a, it's a character in and of itself that I do not feel in the new movie. Oh. And we'll go the into it. The new one does a 180. Like, it's, like, the city doesn't even exist. Yeah. You could copy and paste another city, unfortunately, and it, yep. you would still get the same result. Um, but You could have told me, like, it's in Oregon. I'd be like, okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Checks, out. Uh, Checks out. But with this, it's important to know the history of the area, the history of, you know, this part of Chicago, and how much it influences uh, not only this movie, but like the, the legend of Candyman and why we're here in the first place. So um, next scene is uh, when she finds Candyman in his lair, he tells her that surrendering to him will, will ensure Anthony's safety. We skip a lot of shit. Also, he's sleeping on a slab just like Dracula. <laughs> and I'm like... He looks... Uh, this was the best. It's like... <laughs> She's she gets up there. She's looking at the wall because it has like the paintings and yeah. everything. And she turns around and he's just like, just like Dracula <laughs> in his coffin type of situation. I'm like, OK, <laughs> that's bold. And she grabs a hook mm -hmm. and she does stab him. But it doesn't affect right. him. And he's like, <clears throat> gets horny for Helen. The yes. it, ho the only way I can describe what happens in this next like three minutes is nothing but er like horror erotica. <laughs> yes, that's a beautiful description. Good job. This is horror erotica. She you no know, surrender to me. Yeah, be my victim. And she's like, okay, well, if Anthony's gonna be safe, I'll be your victim. And he picks her up, and she's entranced again. She's she's put in another trance, yeah. and he says like, "Are you ready?" And she's like, "I'm scared." And he says of the pain or of what happens like like basically what happens after death right. and she's like 
very honestly, both. Yeah. I'm fucking petrified of both of them. And he's like carrying her. It's like the giant stone slab that he was like sleeping on. And he he's like, the pain will be exquisite. It's And like people will remember you through the ages. So very erotic. Very. And I just also want to mention throughout this scene, the lighting and the makeup on Helen makes it look like an old Hollywood film. Again, we're going back to like yep. the noir era and we can even again, touch on Dracula and how this is supposed to feel. Like you said, I think horror erotica is the perfect description. <laughs> um, which is followed by the most erotic part of this movie. <laughs> He takes his hook and puts it right up her skirt. Oh, yes, he does. Um, that's a choice. Uh, I un- I get it, though. I it's 100% like, understand. I, I, like this, this gets it. Yes. And then, w- then what happens next is something I have a fun fact for. Please. Is it about he, the bees? The bees. Okay. Yes. Please explain. He kisses her. Yeah. And, oh, God. you know, the bees. And he opens up his chest and, you know, the bees. Um, if I remember correctly, he had in he's those were all in his mouth. Okay, like, all the bees on him were on him. No, how the fuck did they get bees in Tony Todd's mouth? I don't know. I don't want to. I don't. I think he probably like funneled in into his I, mouth most likely. I I can't. It did not look fake. Now, because it, it, it wasn't. Oh, now God. he had it in his contract, <laughs> like a king. Oh my God! Like the king he is. If I remember correctly, he had in his contract. Every bee sting was an extra thousand dollars he had to get paid out. Fuck yes, Tony. <laughs> you get that fucking money. Holy shit. I would do that too because like, you want me to get stung by bees? Yeah, fuck you. Okay, how much money are you paying me <laughs> per sting? Oh my and God. And he opens up his mouth and the bees are coming out and he opens up his chest and you see like the skin ripped mm. and like the bees coming out. I am. It's just the bees. I'm actually feeling the ill bees. just remembering and this scene. And she passes out. Honestly. Um, uh, but also, I want to talk about what he's telling Helen. Um, so are we supposed to infer that... She, I think this is what this is where my thought process went. That she is the bloodline of his original lover. Um, um, possibly, because the next thing I have is he vanishes when Anthony and Helen awakes to discover a mural of Candyman and his lover who bears a striking resemblance to her. Exactly. And his line is, it was always you, Helen. Does that mean that she was always his lover or she was the killer the whole time and it never was Candyman? Like he was I acting don't think it, through her body and she was the I, one who actually committed these crimes. I don't think it can be the second one because everyone sees him get killed at the end of this movie. Okay. Um, now, do I think he's the one who killed the dog and everything? No. I actually think she was transed into doing that stuff. Right. But, like, the stuff with Bernadette and everything, I firmly believe that was him. Okay. That was all him. Um... The Candyman promises to release Anthony if Helen helps him strike fear into Cabrini Green's residence. Um, attempting to feed his legend, the Candyman, um, Regine, sorry, and um, attempts to immolate both Helen and Anthony in a bonfire. This is part. This is probably the part of the movie where like stuff kind of gets a little awry. Yeah. Because I'm like, why is the bonfire there again? It was. It's alluded to earlier in the movie. Right. It's that, it's a neighborhood it's, thing that they do apparently. Yeah. Um, but I I get it. Um, they're going into the fires of hell together. They're being reborn yeah. together. There's a lot of symbolism here. Um, it's definitely a choice. And <laughs> I think it's who sees her again, going into the debris and Jake. mistakes her for Candyman. It's Jake. Okay. I I'm pretty sure it's Jake, the kid. But Jake sees her. Yep. And he's like, eh, he's here. And then him and like the other residents come and they start to burn it down. Yeah. Um, and the, it, it, it's basically like a giant struggle between her and him and her just trying to get Anthony out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's the point, I mean, I'm probably skipping a little bit ahead, but she is losing all of her strength. She's being attacked by Candyman. She's having, you know, smoke and inhalation. She's a fucking mess. And then there's a flash I thought that this was a beautiful scene. There's a flash of Anne Marie's face 
that she sees and that gives her that last bit of strength to save anthony from the fire fun fact is you didn't skip because the next thing is literally the end of this fight okay the next note's literally the end of the okay. fight uh the flames destroy the candy man and helen dies but and what helen dies while saving anthony the residents, led by Anne Marie, pay their respect at Helen's funeral. Also, I just want to talk about the makeup and the stunt acting for the scene with Helen coming yes. out of that fire. Yes. Amazing job. Amazing job. Um, but it was a really touching scene that in the end that they they know that this woman was not the killer or the kidnapper. And she really was the savior for Anthony. Um, even the police officer who was like, you know, like literally antagonizing her like 20, 30 minutes ago yeah. is the one who puts the fire out on her. I think, I think so. Something like that. Um, but very beautiful scene. Um, do you have anything more before we go to the funeral or, uh, no, I just remember feeling very nice about the funeral because I remember, actually I do have one thing to add. When I first watched this movie, because I remember I, I when I first watched this movie a long time ago, I remember thinking – because it was like when I was probably getting into horror a little bit more. And I was like, wait, what? She doesn't live? Because, like, you know, that's not something that happens in a lot of horror movies. Um, so I was surprised. But when I was re-watching it, I kind of understood because the only natural conclusion to her story is she has to die. She needs that redemption for everything that she either has done or has been blamed for and this was the way to do it yeah um but the the funeral scene was beautiful i was very moved um when it was it ended up just being trevor and the side piece i think were there for the funeral no one showed up um i think it's i think the i think the lawyer is there also yeah but whatever um it's a very <laughs> like, everyone there doesn't truly care for her and then when we see the neighborhood of caprini green coming down the road to come pay their respects uh to helen was very very moving to me i, I liked it a lot and then they dropped the hook in her um yeah so they're buried together yeah um at home the grief-stricken and guilt-ridden Cheber looks into the mirror and says Helen's name five times, whereupon Helen's vengeful spirit appears and kills him. It's absolutely fucking deserved. <laughs> also, I remember the girlfriend. Oh, yeah. She does what Helen does earlier yep. in the movie where she's like, let's make a dinner together. And he is, you know. I think he's even worse now than yes. he was originally. Because he's remembering how good Helen was compared to the side piece. And he's like, you know, I fucked up. Helen, I miss you. Blah, blah, blah. Woo, 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 woo. And then she comes in and gets her revenge. Also, the one thing I remember about this, because I was like, whoa. Like, I forgot. This is the 90s. This is where, like, movies were starting to be cool with, like, women not wearing bras. Oh. And, like, movie scenes. <laughs> I could tell how cold that set was <laughs> by that actress. I was just like, okay. <laughs> Good on you. And she like, she's like, can you help me make the salad? And he's like, I'll be out in a minute. Yeah. Sure. And she's like, rightfully so, like, fuck this guy. Yeah, he's the piece of shit. Um, and the end is kind of like, it's, it's kind of going full circle. Uh, the side piece is seen with the dead body. Of Trevor holding a, knife. holding a knife, freaking out. And it's just, you know, the continuation cycle of the legend of Helen and Candyman. Um, and then the final note I have is a new mural of Helen dressed in white with hair ablaze appears in Candyman in the Candyman's lair. Yep. And we end the movie. Yeah. Um so I'm gonna let you decide. Do we talk about the movie now, or do we talk about both movies in the end? Uh, we'll do it at the end. Okay. All right. Cool. So, so it's time to go to 2021. All right. Let's. Also, yeah. I just want to note something. Yes. Right here, right now. In a few months, this movie's going to be 30 years old. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but the reason why I'm saying that is the one thing I realized with this movie when i was watching it and when it was over is this the reason why i like it and the reason why it has 
I can watch it and not feel like, oh my god, this movie's so old. I can't date the movie. Right. It feels like, yes, it lives on Earth, but it feels like an Earth that's completely separated from ours. And unfortunately, the things and the issues that they're talking about that is is the core of this movie, you know, racial issues, class issues, stuff like that, has not gotten better. So I think that also adds to the point of, I can't date this movie. It could have happened in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. It could have happened today. But it also doesn't rely on... The one thing you always do, the thing that will always be bad is if you rely on brands or technology that is associated with the years that your movie comes out. Right. And we'll... Which is something the new movie does really badly. Exactly. Um, This movie, it's like, I think the most technology I get to see is the computer. Right like oh that's old but the phone lines i'm like okay that could be the 70s 80s 90s up to like mid to late 2000s -hmm. and you know the way it's like it's fashioned and the way everything is i would believe it was in the mid 2000s Um, that was one thing i really wanted to talk about for sure before we move on we'll get into it when we do our little wrap up at the end but let's go ahead and jump into Five innocent people killed, not a sign of a human.